The end result is that not one dollar of existing money has changed hands, but thirty thousand dollars of new bank credit has been created and spent into the money supply, and each of the three banks gets to collect interest on ten thousand dollars of it. Is creation of this brand new thirty thousand dollars really an act of fraud, like counterfeiting? The obvious difference is that the banking system is legal, regulated by government, and disciplined by the courts to follow the rules of accounting. Another difference is that there is no obvious victim, like the person getting caught with a counterfeit bill. Banks argue that the buyer and the seller both got what they wanted and agreed to. So where is the fraud? And if there was a fraud, who lost out? Well, to determine that, let us list who got what out of the deal. The borrower got the item he desired on terms he willingly agreed to. He may curse his decision later as he struggles to make the interest payments, or he may live happily ever after, thankful he got the loan. The seller got an increase in bank credit. Which she's been conditioned since childhood to think of as her money in the bank, she's confident that she'll be able to spend it in turn, and she will. So, as far as the seller is concerned, she has been paid in full. She's happy. So, who, if anyone, suffered as a result of the deal? Is there another party to this transaction we've overlooked? Well, there's also the bank that gets to collect interest on a promise to pay money. That's the business they are in, and usually do very well by. And anyone else? Well, where did the car come from? It came from the world of real things. Natural resources, energy, and labor were expended to produce it. What if we consider the hidden party to be society at large and the natural world from which all things ultimately come? Because the brand new bank credit money didn't just sit there; it got spent into the general circulation in the real world. It's the real world that ultimately gets the new money in exchange for its car. This new money might stimulate new production, temporarily enlarging the economy, making lots of people happy. In fact, it often does, as most bank credit comes into being as a home mortgage, stimulus for the residential construction industry, a big provider of good-paying jobs. However, after its initial productive use, this newly created money. Will basically just dilute the money supply, reducing money's purchasing power by a very small amount. So, in contrast to counterfeiting, where the loss occurs to a specific victim, here the loss is borne by us all, because the real substance of the loan, the car, was extracted from the economy at large by a slight loss in the value of everyone's money. To continue our comparison of bank credit with counterfeiting, counterfeit cash eventually gets detected and removed from circulation, causing a direct loss to whoever accepted it. There is, of course, no guarantee of how much will be detected, nor any prescribed schedule for its removal. Bank credit is also removed from circulation over time because, as bank credit is paid back, the principal part of every payment is extinguished. Now remember that almost all the money in existence today is bank credit. Therefore, almost every dollar that passes through our bank accounts has a scheduled appointment to one day be paid as a principal payment on a bank loan and cease to exist. On top of the principal are the interest payments, which will become bank income, much of which will be recycled into the economy as interest to depositors and other bank expenses. So it's not immediately apparent that there's a loss to someone as a result of bank credit being withdrawn from circulation, the way there is with counterfeit cash. But if we look closer, we find an interesting situation. We don't need anything more than fundamental arithmetic to understand the power that lies in controlling the money supply and why, as currently designed, total debt must constantly expand, or the system collapses. Whenever the rate of debt money creation falls behind the rate of debt money destruction, the total amount of money in use will shrink. This is called deflation because the money supply is shrinking like a deflating balloon. The result is less money relative to the goods and services available. 
With less money around to pay for them, the price of goods and services go down. At first, this sounds like a good thing, and it could be, if money were not created as debt at interest. For anyone not in debt, deflation would be like a general dividend on money, paid in goods and services of our choice. It would be as if money were the people's stock in their own prosperous company, their nation. People wouldn't have to demand a pay raise. If a nation were more productive as a whole, thus deserving of a raise, everyone would benefit automatically by having their money buy more. However, this is definitely not the effect deflation has in a system where money comes in the form of interest-bearing debt. More than 95% of all money currently in existence is in the form of debt to banks, promises to pay with interest added. And as we have seen, the principal is created, but not the interest. Due to the time delay between money's creation and its repayment, and the recycling of interest earnings as bank operating expenses, most of us can keep up our payments while the money supply is increasing. However, if the money supply or total debt is decreasing, money becomes harder to earn due to its scarcity, and fixed payments become harder to meet. For those heavily in debt, the money shortage can become catastrophic. Unfortunately, the psychological effects of falling wages and prices rapidly accelerate the process as borrowers, including large businesses, lose confidence in being able to repay loans so that they don't sign up for any. And without new loans to replace old loans, the money shortage rapidly gets worse, resulting in a decrease in jobs and purchasing power even in the midst of abundant resources and productive capacity. This dismal spiraling math makes mass foreclosures inevitable. Prices plummet as no one wants to spend their money. Shrinking values destroy the value of loan collateral, causing banks to write off huge losses. Some even close their doors. Consumer and business confidence is lost. Rampant economic and social dysfunction follows. This disastrous spiral cannot be turned around unless the government creates new money itself or goes deeply in debt to private banks in order to create enough new money to reorganize and rejuvenate the economy. The most familiar example of this is the stock market crash of 1929. The psychological fallout of the stock market collapse resulted in less borrowing and thus less new money. The Federal Reserve did nothing to correct the resultant deflation and by 1932 the money supply had been reduced by a third. Countless people were evicted from their homes because the money to make their mortgage payments simply ceased to exist. Then, in 1932, Franklin Roosevelt became the U.S. President. Roosevelt's New Deal set out to restore the economy by restoring the money supply. To counter the money shortage, Roosevelt borrowed from the private banking system. Factories started hiring again. But only when the war arrived, there's suddenly no shortage of jobs or funds available to do what was necessary for the war effort. It was the money expended on World War II that ended the Great Depression. The war also resulted in 50 million deaths worldwide and led to a new hostile international balance of power with its attendant arms races, mounting debts, and sweeping social and technological transformations. <laughs>